Hello, this is Mike with another Fusion validation model. Uh, today we're going to be taking a look at a cantilever beam with a nodal force. It comes from Rourke's Formulas for Stress and Strain, the 5th edition, page 96, table 3, case 1a. And the description of it is that it's a 16-inch long cantilever beam. We're going to fix it at one of the ends. The other end of it will be free. It's 1 inch by 1 inch square and we're going to apply a 100 pound downward force at the center of the beam. Modulus will be 30 E6, Poisson's ratio 0.3, and the target deflection that we are looking for in this one is 0 0.017067 uh, negative. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we have here. Here's the cantilever beam that I've already constructed, one inch by one inch, 16 inches long, and again, the constraints are pretty simple. We're just going to fix one of the ends. The force, we want 100 pounds force right in the center of it. So I have split up the top faces of this beam. So that way I have a vertex right there uh, in the center. Or if I highlight that surface, you can see then we have a corner uh, right in the middle width-wise and then 8 inches down the span of it so that way we'll be able to add our force exactly where we want now if you've been watching um, these videos a variety of these videos a lot of times we do have special requirements for our loads where they're located on a model uh, only a certain portion of the model etc so you know i've shown it a couple times how to split different geometry it certainly is a a handy tool something that i would certainly keep in mind uh, as you are constructing your own geometries and um, hopefully that allows you to get the forces and locations where you need them to be or pressures only in specific areas of the model uh, where you need them to be. Certainly, again, a, a convenient uh, thing to know about. So let's go ahead and switch over to the simulation environment. And then the simulation environment, this is going to be a static stress. And we'll go ahead and start with the materials. So I'm going to use a standard Fusion library material. Let me first of all, uh, in the lower left-hand corner, I'm going to switch to make sure that uh, I am using just the Fusion 360 material library. I do have, you know, I have created a number of other libraries for myself, but we're going to use the standard Fusion 360 material library. And then we'll scroll down until we get to a Steel ASTM. We're going to choose the A36 material uh, because the Young's modulus is, is basically right there where we need it. Poisson's ratio, more importantly, is right at 0 0.3, uh, which is what we need. So uh, that's it for the material. If I expand the browser, we can see the material is defined. We do need to define some constraints. Um, so let me, it had the whole body selected. So let me go ahead and clear that. And I'm going to select one face. So there we go. There's one of the end faces constrained. And we are going to fully fix it. So we're going to leave UX, UI, UZ highlighted, indicating that we are fully fixing uh, those directions. We'll say OK to that. Next are the loads. We do have a variety of loads. In this case, we are just going to do a structural load. Even under structural loads, you have a number of different loads to choose from. In this case, we are going to utilize a force. And when you apply the, the force loads, you can select surfaces and edges and vertices or endpoints uh, on your geometry. So we're going to select that location right there. And I'll tab over to the Y field. This is, of course, X, Y, and Z. You can also type it over here in the dialog box. Again, the force is going to be minus 100 pounds, and we'll say OK to that. So there is our force, and if we expand the load cases uh, under the browser, you can see our loads and constraints have populated into the browser also. So if we needed to edit any of those, we could come hover over it, click the pencil icon, and, and change it. So again, moving across the panel bar here. We don't have to do anything with contacts because this model is not an assembly. I think we will get into some of those uh, here in the, the future. The mesh, let's go ahead and generate the mesh. I'm just going to take the standard mesh to begin with. And 
you'll see that it ends up being a, a pretty coarse mesh. Now, let's take a deeper dive on that. In the mesh settings, we can adjust the slider either towards the coarse end of the spectrum or towards the finer end. If we have an assembly, we can scale it per part. So we could have a coarser mesh on our larger parts, smaller mesh on smaller parts. You can also specify an absolute mesh size. And I did do that, uh, not right now in this example, but prior. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit about that. Uh, but what I wanted to show was under the advanced mesh settings. So if we take a look at this mesh, uh, I can't adjust the orientation why I have this dialog up, but um, it is a parabolic mesh. Uh, it is creating curved mesh elements by default. We don't necessarily need to worry about that for this model, but I wanted to mention that the element order is parabolic instead of linear. So our mesh is coarse, right? So you can see we have an endpoint to the mesh here, endpoint of the mesh here of it being parabolic. Uh, it does give us a, a calculation point or a node point uh, in the center of that element. So technically we have three node points across the, the thickness and that's about the minimum uh, of where you'd wanna go. And we'll run with the default mesh first of all to see what we get out of it in the results. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, okay, let's go ahead and solve that model. This should be really quick. We're just gonna run it locally. We'll go ahead and click on solve. And there you can see everything's basically complete. As we come into the results, it's gonna show us the safety factor, which is not our concern right now. We're looking at displacements. And technically what we wanna see is displacement in the Y direction, right? So under displacement, we can change it from total, which is a square root sum of the squares uh, calculation of the X, Y, and Z components. We just wanna look at the Y component. And when we do that, then of course you get positive and negative values or can get positive and negative values in a model because some of it might be deflecting in the, along the positive direction of the Y axis. Some could be deflecting in the negative Y. So there is our result. And we're gonna plug that into our spreadsheet here. And we get a negative um, 0 0.01731 and I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter. So there you can see we have a difference from the hand calculation of 1.43%. Uh, and that's really, I don't think not bad at all. Um, but what I would say about that is, you know, the mesh is kind of the minimum of where we need it to be, right? So the mesh is rather coarse for this geometry. And I, I don't know that I would ever go quite that coarse me personally, I'm always striving to get about two elements through the thickness. So if I come back to my mesh and I go into mesh settings, we know it's one inch by one inch square, right? So we could set an absolute mesh size and say that we want to use a mesh size of 0.5 inch. Notice when I change that mesh size, then a couple of these things get exclamation points, little warnings, meaning you know, I haven't generated the mesh yet and my results are gonna be out of date or, or not gonna be in sync with the mesh. So let's go ahead and generate the mesh. And there is our, our mesh. We still have the warning here about results, right? Because we haven't computed the new results yet. But now you can see that we have two elements uh, across the thickness. And again, keeping in mind the higher order, that means I have a node here. There's technically a node there, another one here and so on. So I have multiple nodes and, and that's really kind of important for uh, bending. So uh, obviously if I were just fixing this end and adding a force at the other end and pulling this in tension or compressing it, it wouldn't be a, an issue because we have so many elements along the axis. But in this case, we're bending it um, uh, along the, the thickness of it. And so I wanna make sure I have an adequate mesh uh, there. So when we solve that, uh, what you're going to see here is that our, our displacements will increase a little bit. And I don't think that the results um, are going to, to really be all that bad. Let's close this. We're in displacement Y. Let's go back to our spreadsheet. So before uh, we had a result of our percent difference of 1.4% at 0 0.01731. We are now at a value of 0 0.01757. And that takes us up to about 3%. And I think that that is about uh, the, the 
maximum amount of difference that we're going to stray from that hand calculation. Uh, and the reason that I say that is because I've even gone finer on the mesh. And here you can see we have an extremely fine mesh on the geometry. You wouldn't necessarily ever use a mesh size globally uh, on a real world larger scale model. You know, this is uh, overkill having that many elements uh, through the thickness. But there uh, you can see the displacement is even a little bit different. 0.017, uh, 63, and that's going to take us right around 3% to 3.3%. So uh, I think we're right in there uh, in the ballpark. Those results aren't uh, really bad at all. It's it's within the target, I would say, of, of what we would expect to get out of this analysis with a solid model. So, um, you know, obviously, if we were saying something like 10%, 20%, then, then obviously I would be concerned. At that point, I'd be looking to see if we set up the model correctly. Is the load correct, the boundary conditions, uh, things like that. But overall, I think uh, this is another successful uh, validation model. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Take care.